and, and several of you have um, uh, recursive servers that now do validation, etc. So that's good. I, I'm aware that not all of you are completely done with the exercise so far, but I still want to push on, and I want to push on for several reasons. One reason is that, well, there just isn't time in one day to, to fit everything, and what we're doing right now, which is basically manual signing of a zone, is not what anyone in a sane mind would do these days. Because today we will use some sort of automated tools that keeps the zone signed automatically. So the, the, the point with showing you the manual steps is to show you the importance of choosing a sensible system for actually keeping this running in an operational context rather than sort of hobbyist level where it breaks whenever you turn your back on it. Um, so now you've, you've seen it, although you may not be completely done with it. On the other hand, you have a full week of nothing else to do, so you can log in over the network and continue with the exercises with all the parts you haven't done. Okay? So, there's a bunch of topics here, and we will touch upon them, and some of them we will skip over. The first topic is key management, and the problems of generating keys on schedule. If you roll your keys, as in you change to a new key and you stop using the old key, that means you also have to regenerate new keys occasionally. And as we, we touched upon before, there are different schools here when it comes to key rollovers. Th there's one school which says the safest alternative is not to roll your keys at all. Just use one key forever because it's risky to roll your keys. Something could go, could go wrong. I am not in that camp. I believe that you must have a system where you can replace your keys, because sooner or later you will be forced to replace your keys, and if you don't have a process in place for it, you will sort of stumble badly when it's really, really crucial. So I think that if key rollovers are too complicated, that means we have more software development to do. And we are actually getting there. So. Zone signing key rollovers these days are completely automated, and key signing key rollovers are getting automated. So that's where we should be heading instead. Well, there, there are more parents than Iana. Iana is just one parent. There are millions of parents, and Iana is not the worst one. Um, so ju just to take a look at, at the key rollover problem, um, we will look at what, what are the steps to go through to make this happen in, in a safe and, and uh, compre comprehensible fashion. Well, the first step is that you have a key signing key for your zone, and you have a zone signing key for your zone, and then you will use the key signing key to sign all the keys. That's those two. Those are the keys. So the signature covers this RR set. And then the zone signing key has generated signatures for all sorts of other stuff in the zone. So this is sort of the outset for a key rollover. What's the next step? The next step is to add a new zone signing key. So now we have the old zone signing key and we have the new zone signing key and we generate a new signature that covers all three. Then we wait for a bit. And when we've waited a bit, the signatures for the signatures generated by this key will start to expire, and new signatures will start to be generated by that key instead. In the fullness of time, all of these will disappear, and all the signatures will be generated by the new key after waiting even longer. And when that happens, we can replace the old key, as in take it out and regenerate this signature again, because now it only covers those two keys, and, and we're done. The, the, the key takeaway here is that every step here requires waiting. Why does it require waiting? It requires waiting because stuff is cached, and you have to wait for the stuff to expire from the caches. So there's no way of doing a key rollover just like this. 
for safety, you will have to wait a bit. And for that reason, you really, do, you really want to have a process for this where you continually are somewhere along to the next key rollover. So new keys are already being published with the intent of switching to them a couple of weeks from now, for instance, so that it's working its way through all these caches and all th through all this waiting. Because, because you cannot just force it very quickly if you need to, if you haven't started several weeks ago. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this is basically the same thing, but shown in a different way. So here you have time, and here you have keys down here, and signatures up here. When you start, you have the old zone signing key, and you have signatures from the old zone signing key. At some point, you introduce the new key, and then you wait a time which we call propagation delay, the time until we know that the new key has propagated everywhere into every cache wherever it should be. At that point, when the new key has fully propagated, we switch so that new signatures are generated by the new key, Old signatures are still in existence in caches and will expire over time. After waiting the propagation delay time again, all of these will have expired from all caches and they will be gone. And at that time it will be safe to remove the old key, so we cut it out of the zone and then you just have the new key and signatures by the new key. So it's the same story as the previous diagrams showed, but in time rather than key states. Here's another one. Still, th still the same story. These are the states of each key. So the old key starts being generated, then it gets published. Published means that it's put into the zone, but still not being used for signing anything. Then the key becomes ready. Ready is a key which has been published for sufficiently long to be safe to use for signing. That means that it's been there so long that no other key could be in the caches. If anything is cached, it will be this key. S once it's ready, you decide to start using it as the key you sign with. That's when it's active. And that at some point in time, you want to switch from this key being active to the next key being active. This is the rollover point in time. But before that key can become active, it must be ready. And it won't be ready until it's been published for sufficiently long, and it cannot be published until it's been generated. So you can basically design on a policy here which says, I want to roll to a new active key once every, let's say, four weeks. And then you can just do the numbers in reverse and realize when you need to publish the, the next key and you can sort of just keep this machinery going. So to, to design the system that does this automatically is quite feasible and such systems exist, OpenDNS being one of them. It's a large number of steps, so you really do not want to do this manually. You want to have software that does it for you. In the parent case, as in the key signing key ca case, where we have this record in the parent that identifies the key signing key in the child, we need a new record. This is the so-called so -called DS record, delegation signer record. It's yet a new record type. We have a whole bunch of them in DNSSEC. We have DNS key, we have RRSIG, now we have DS, and there will be more of them. So the DS record is just a hash of the key signing key of the parent. And the hash is a one-way function. So if you have the key, you can compute the hash. But if you have the hash, you cannot compute the key. So it's considered to be safe from that point of view. And of course the DS record is signed by the parent and therefore you get a signature chain that goes from parent key to RRSIG of the DS to the DS to the key signing key that the DS identifies to the said signing key, zone signing key that the key signing key signs, etc, etc, etc. So this is 
part of the twisty part of the signature chain. And here are details of how to create them. And Th this, this is actually a very, very important part of this, this course. And I wish we had more time to spend on it. So I will give you all homework to, to actually take a look at this. Not necessarily doing labs, but uh, make a mental note that you once said that this was important stuff. So why is this important stuff? Well, it's important stuff because if you look at the world in general and all the DNS stuff that is being used everywhere, a lot of the DNS stuff in the world is broken. The world is fully capable of breaking DNS stuff in all sorts of creative ways with just standard DNS. When you add DNSSEC to the mix, it gets slightly more complicated. Slightly more complicated means that you can break it in lots of new and very, very creative ways. And when it breaks, it's rather difficult to troubleshoot. The reason why it becomes difficult to troubleshoot DNSSEC scenarios and DNSSEC environments is that you have all this crypto stuff all over. So if something fails to validate, how do you actually verify that when it doesn't work? The only th thing you see is strings of, of characters that are signatures and strings of characters that are keys. How do you see that that actually is an expired signature that doesn't validate anymore? The only th thing you see is stuff. So the debugging part of DNSSEC is really, really key to making this work operationally. You must have a structured approach to how to sort out problems. The, the traditional method, which we all use for standard DNS, which is, oh, it broke, horrible, let's run around in circles and, and scream for a bit and, and hope that the problem goes away. That, that, that actually works now and then with, with standard DNS. It could be a notify that was lost and the slave will just refresh and, and the problem goes away. Doesn't work with DNSSEC. You must have a structured approach for how to deal with the problems. And the only thing I can do here is basically give you a couple of pointers. So, dig is fine, but not really the solution here. Um, logging, that's important. You can increase the level of logging detail in the server. That helps. As in logging detail specifically for DNSSEC problems. Um, Checking that the zone is actually correct. There are tools for that. Valid DNS is one. Name the check zone is another one. Uh, there is something called, um, I don't remember, but there, there's several other zone checking tools that do consistency checking, including validating the signatures on stuff. Use those. Here is. Um, Debugging using the, the command line tool Drill that comes from NLNet Labs. And Drill is uh, a, a, a dig, dig alternative which has certain advantages over dig. In particular, uh, Drill can chase signature chains. So here we have an example where everything was good. And dig basically chases trying to validate ns.echo.dnslab quad A, and it chases that all the way to the DNS key for root, and this is the trusted key that we, that we use. Um, so that is the trusted key that is configured up there, and we're telling Drill to use that trusted key. So this is how it looks when everything is fine. How does it look when it's not as good? When it's not as good, you get some sort of feedback. DNSSEC signature has expired. And it says which signature, and it says for what RR set, and which key. So if you compare this to 
just looking at various bits and the only thing you got was serve fail trying to look something up. If you try to look the same thing up with drill saying use the key in this file as the trusted key and do a signature chase down to this thing it will tell you exactly where in the signature chain that stuff broke. Very useful. It's trivial when you see it this way. Before we had this type of support in drill, it was a nightmare to figure it out. Really, really horrible. So things are actually getting better. Here is another example. This is a, an online tool called DNSVis. So you can just go to the DNSVis website and you can type in your, the name of your zone and it will chase the, trust, uh, the signature chain down from the root down to, to your zone. And it has all sorts of, of well, visual feedback. Uh, gray background, not gray background, uh, oval, uh, dotted oval, full oval, etc. These different geographical shapes and colors and things indicate different states and different contexts and just visually you can see where it's broken. Really useful. Warmly recommended. So that's that. Mm. So when you query for something that doesn't exist, you get back an NX domain. We looked at that before lunch. How to prove that something doesn't exist is really complicated. And here we cover how to do that. It requires a bunch of new record types and it gets rather messy. We will skip that over. But I will just say one thing and that is that because this is rather complicated, there has been proposals that we should just do DNSSEC in a simpler way by only authenticating positive data, as in here we have a piece of information and we put the signature on it so that we can verify its authenticity. That's fine. And not even bother with how to verify non-existence. That is unfortunately a flawed line of argument because if you don't have this which is called authenticating negative responses, if you don't have that, it's possible to spoof away all the security that DNS gives you. So for example, if you have a signed delegation, my zone, axfr.net, is a signed zone underneath net, which is a signed zone, and there is a DS record and the signed delegation so that you can follow the signature chain all the way from the root through net down into axfr.net and everything is signed and fine and really, really nice. If we don't have authenticated denial of existence, if someone can send in a forged NX domain and it will not be verified but still believed, they could send in a forged negative response saying there is no DS record for AXFR.net. And suddenly the resolver would believe that AXFR.net is not signed and it wouldn't bother with the signatures and it would be spoofed again. So as long as we don't have authenticated denial of existence, we have this sort of giant, gigantic backdoor in the DNS system where the bad guys can still spoof away the result of the efforts we've made than we've, when we've signed all the positive stuff. So we do need this. It's messy, but we do need it. It's seriously messy. Anyone here heard of Dane? Is that a known thing? Yeah. 
Dane is important. You can read about Dane in various places. Here we cover the DNS side of Dane. And that brings us to what I really want to talk about, which is how to keep the zone signed. Um, we've talked about signatures expiring. That, that's one of the things that people keep asking about DNSSEC. They, they, in many other systems, like for instance, PKI systems like X509, you have a usage policy associated with the public key. So typically, a, a, a certificate is a public key together with some sort of policy which says this may be used for that purpose and this may be used during this particular time interval and then it shouldn't be used anymore. So th in X509 they associate the policy with the key. In DNSSEC we do it the other way around. The policy as in the usage the lifetime etc is associated with the signature not with the key. The key is just a raw string of bits and from a DNSSEC point of view it's fine just using the same key forever. The reasons for not using the same key forever but rather rolling the key has to do with security not policy. As in it works fine not rolling it but you should roll it. So that's about the key and then you have the signatures that you need to regenerate on a periodic schedule. So somehow you need to switch from a mode of operation where your zone lives in a zone file and you reload your names over only when you've changed something. Okay, so running the signer like the NSX sign zone or something that you played with before, before the break, you could run that through cron. So once a week a cron job starts up and it will just run the signer and it will reload the name server. And that actually works and many people do that but it's sort of a, a crafty solution to, to a serious problem and perhaps you should have some more appropriate software support for this operation of keeping the zone signed and that brings us to modern signing engines so what is a signing engine? well the way I look at it is that over here many organizations have some sort of, of zone generation workshop. If you look at any TLD registry, they, they have all sorts of stuff in place to generate the zone file. Databases and auditing and stuff. And at the end of all the stuff, out comes an unsigned zone file. Now we could either redesign this workshop to emit a signed zone file instead and we would have to redo everything and all the auditing and everything has to be rebuilt. Or we can say we will leave that as it is. No changes whatsoever. There's nothing wrong with the unsigned zone file. It has exactly the right content. The only problem is that it isn't signed. And through a zone transfer, which is the standard mechanism we have to move the zone around, we just transfer the zone into a signer and what the signer does is it takes an unsigned zone in, signs it and emits a signed zone out. The slave over here will be more or less non the wiser. It used to get the zone transfer with the zone in it, it still gets the zone transfer with the zone in it, it just happens to be slightly different contents with all these signatures but if you're a slave server you, you don't have a say in the contents of the zone. So th you don't need to change anything in the process here. You don't need to change anything in the process here. You just add this bump on the wire. And that's why this design is so appreciated. So what happens here if there are no changes to the masters, to the unsigned zone? You only update it when you make a change and you don't make a change for three months for some reason. Well, as long as the signer engine is running, in spite of not getting any new versions of the zone here, this one will emit new versions periodically because it will resign stuff and generate new signatures and send the new IXFR out and this one will keep publishing new versions. 
The requirement for this to work is that this is a signer engine. It's not a tool that you run on demand. It's something that runs continuously, tracks the expiration times of signatures, knows what to resign and when, and emit a new version of the zone. There's a whole bunch of software, and we will look at OpenDNSSEC. OpenDNSSEC is rather large and complex. Or, or should I give this to you? There are lots of versions. Uh, the version we've been running until recently has been 1.4 point something. And a major change happened a couple of years ago when the registries that initially funded OpenDNSSEC stepped back and handed over uh, further development to NLNS Labs. So NLNS Labs have been working for two years-ish, or even more. Uh, yeah. Uh, for, yeah one and a half. Something like that. A long, a long time. And just some weeks ago, we finally saw version 2.0, which is a major re-implementation re of OpenDNSSEC. I am familiar with OpenDNSSEC in a second now, but I'm not familiar with the slides again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, we, um, we participated in the OpenDNSSEC project before, um, but um, due to a number of changes, um, it became uh, proficient to uh, take over the project as a whole. Um, we at NLNet Labs have taken over a number of projects. NSD and Unbound were originally cooperations between different uh, parties and which took over the further development and maintenance of them. And like so also opening in the SEC has been adopted by us and um, we're now maintaining it. I'll, I'll not go into what we've changed in 2.0 because I have a slot for that. <coughs> um, a slight note on on on, uh, on your keys. Smaller. Uh, um, give me a note when I reach my time about. Um, um, for smaller companies, it's not that important, but big organizations, TLDs, etc., matter a lot about security in their keys. If your keys are out in the open, if your machine is breached, then it doesn't mind, uh, matter how well you have signed your zone. If it's breached, they can just steal your keys and resign the zone and take over your zone as well. Um, this is why uh, sometimes keys are, um, a lot of times, keys are kept in specialized hardware where the keys never leave the hardware and the hardware itself cannot be breached because it has no entrance. Um, th this hardware is quite expensive, mainly for uh, certification reasons, and it's also very fast, so you can do a lot of signing with it. That adds a lot of, of uh, efficiently efficiency uh, to the signing process. But there, as said, it's often very expensive, so there's also software solutions uh, to that. For opening in a sec, it doesn't matter whether you use a software solution or a hardware solution, because there's just one interface, PKCS 11 standard, and whether there's software behind that that does the signing or hardware, it doesn't really matter. But that's where keys can be stored, and we manage the storage uh, in that. Like I said, there's also a software implementation of that. That's also part of the OpenDNSSEC software, but it's not one maintained by us. Um, in the lecture note, it, it, it will give on reasons how to initialize um, that storage of keys. I'll think I of this. <laughs> I'll skip that uh, over. So uh, I already covered the purpose of HSMs. <coughs> DNS 
maintain, uh, DNS maintenance, so the key rollover is actually very complicated and there are a lot of resources to use. You have to use the HSM uh, where the keys are stored. There are procedures on how long to wait, where to get the original data for, for, from, where to send the signed data to. So this needs to be configured. The configured is spread out over a number of um, configuration files. There, there, there's two main splits in there. there. You have the system configuration where you keep the data where, uh, where you say, okay, I'm using these HSMs to store my keys. I've got uh, log files to write to. I've got standard directories to use. And you have the policy file. And the policy file actually tells how to roll the keys, how often to roll the keys, how long to wait, um, uh, which algorithms, and I don't mean uh, key, um, algorithms how to roll the keys, but the DNSSEC, you are allowed to either use GHOST or ECDSA, so which algorithm dare to use. So that's part of the, the, the policy file where you specify how to generate signatures with algorithm to use, the denial which has been skipped, which type of keys to use. You always have case, case, zettes case, but you can actually combine them and use a single type of key. Um, where zones are specified, <coughs> etc. You can have multiple policies. You can have a policy for a quick changing zone file where you want to roll over quickly and try things out. You can have a production uh, uh, policy. Um, different uh, <coughs> situations require different policy. If you're using, if you're on TLD, you have a different policy than if you're a small organization. So it's not fixed. I've seen other solutions where basically this is the policy key will roll over every month and <coughs> we, uh, we uh, depend on these values for uh, the time to live and for how long a, uh, a signature is valid for and you have no choice. Opening the sec gives you a lot of choice in that respect. Um, I don't think I need to go over all the individual uh, items uh, in, the, in the policy files, but I'll just go over a few. Um, the zone file needs to be inspected every once in a while whether signatures need to be regenerated. And this is why the resign and refresh interval are there, to go over them and when to uh, uh, to allow a, a signature to still be valid. You want to re-sign a record before it has actually re, uh, expired. So there's a go over the signatures every once in a while and if a signature has reached its potential age, then start re-signing it. So these are the re-sign and the refresh intervals. But the signatures themselves are valid for an amount of time. So in this case we specify that a signature is valid for seven days. And the negative version of it is also valid for seven days. That's fine. And now all signatures start expiring all at once. Not that bad if you have a small zone file, but if you have .ac, you've got uh, every signature to resign. You know, a huge bug to do. So we actually allow for some jitter in there to, to spread it out over time. The other one, we're going to skip. <coughs> this one is old, it doesn't exist yeah, anymore. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that one updating. There are currently two major parts in Open Inisec the signer and the enforcer. The signer is the bump in the wire that keeps the zone signed. It must be there all the time. If that one is out, your zone get bogus. It will, it will go up bad. But the signer is, in, in a certain respect, dumb. It does only do the signing in time, 
but it doesn't care about the keys. It gets the keys, it will use the keys, but it doesn't do any management of the keys. For this we have the enforcer, which enforces the key management <coughs> and controls which keys to use when. It also runs uh, permanently, but if that one gets killed or hacked, or whatever, uh, there's no, no fire, it's restarted. It, it, it's actually more stable than the signer, but uh, it, it is specifically designed to use the management. There's also a, uh, a difference in the sense that the signer needs to be very memory efficient and very high performance for the enforcer, uh, unless you have 10,000 zones in there. Performance is not a big deal uh, in there. It also only performs certain actions every, at most every quarter of an hour or every few days even. So it's not that important. In the future, we might actually want to distribute the signer if we've got many uh, large zones. The enforcer, there's no point in the. Fifty eleven is a touchy subject. <laughs> it is supported, but uh, and uh, and we have had requests to support it, and there are very few users of it. I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. 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 So this process looks like this uh, the DNS responsibility, right? The DNS server. Right? So well, why not just keep this functionality in the server? That's the bind solution. <laughs> <laughs> um, for one, it, 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 it gets your software far more complex. You have your server has to do many more things. Um, It, so that complexity is actually what killed the Bind 10 project uh, in there. It's also that there's a different role to take care of. Um, open DNS sec as, as, um, as a DNS server doesn't need to be compatible to all of the world. Um, there are buggy versions of DNS servers out there bind and unbound need to be able to cooperate with every bug out there. Open DNSSEC only needs to be aware of well-behaved DNS servers in front and in back that are under your control. You maintain them. Um, so security-wise, there's some security in there in, in T6 and uh, control, but we don't need to implement measures about cache poisoning or um, 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 yeah, uh, rate limiting, things like that. There's no use for that. So can, can I add yeah? a couple of yeah. words here? Um, so so I, I, I agree with the complexity issue. And, and hello? Yeah. I, I agree with the complexity issue being a, a major thing, but it's also a question of having, how should I put it, uh, the ability of replacing broken components. I, if you look at, at the DNS infrastructure where you have a master server and you have slave servers and you decide that that particular slave server implementation that I was using is no longer the right thing. It's not sufficient to high performance, it has slightly too many bugs for my liking or, or whatever, then I can just replace that slave server platform with some other slave server platform as long as the interface to the master is standardized, as in a zone transfer. If you're using a zone transfer to synchronize between those, you can use whatever. If you have a proprietary interface there, suddenly you're sort of stuck with that solution and you cannot replace a component. The same goes for the signer. If you have a bump on the wire, like we, we show here, you can have whatever to generate the master zone file 
over here, uh, what your own software or something. And you can use whatever signer and you can use whatever slave because the interfaces are standardized as zone transfers and there are multiple implementations. If you internalize the signer, like th they've done in Bind and like they are doing in Not DNS, for instance, suddenly you're sitting there with a major component at the beginning of this zone transfer thing that you cannot replace because you're dependent on, on an internal design here. And as long as that's exactly the thing you want, you're fine. One day you wake up and you realize there, there are bugs in there or it's not stable enough and you cannot easily replace it. We at NLNet Labs are, are um, not commercial enough uh, in the sense that we have Unbound and we have NSD and we have Open Intersec and our motto is you can replace any of them with Bind, Not or whatever and keep the other ones. So <coughs> we actually test against the other name servers that we actually replace um, uh, NSD in front of us with, with in front of Open Intersec with Bind and that should work as well. And it's also a matter of architecture. Do one thing well. NSD and Unbound, they're both name servers. Yes, but one is authoritative and the other is recursive. They do different things. They implement the same protocol, but they're geared towards a different usage rather than one kitchen sink to the everything. Okay. So Looking at the, at the labs here, we are somewhere up here. And the next step, according to the lab instruction, was to get a secure delegation by talking to me and to Barry. Now we will move forward to skipping past here. This is what we want. Section 7, using a DNS signer engine. This part of the lab is slightly different from the rest of the labs. It's more detailed. And the reason why it's more detailed is because there are, how should I put it, there are more pitfalls here. Many options to commands, lots of flags. You have to really be careful in doing exactly the right thing. And also, there are many different right solutions. So you could decide that you want to do it this way, and that would be just fine. It's just that then we will never finish on time. We still won't finish on time, but at least we could keep the hope up. So I suggest that you really, really follow the instructions step by step rather than just jumping ahead, because otherwise we will end up in the weeds. The general idea here is that, let's see here. May I give you just one heads up? Open the intersect is really important to check your log file. So either file log messages or if there's a separate log file specified in the configuration, that one because many error conditions are reported there and not on the command line. I'm missing one picture. Oh well. So ju just follow the instructions rather carefully. But there are a couple of, of, of key takeaways, takeaways here that make it slightly more complicated. So takeaway number one, when you look at the bump on the wire drawing that I showed you before, it said master zone transfer, signer zone transfer, slave. That sort of implies that the signer is running on its own box. I would suggest that you run the signer on its own box when you do this for real, at home, etc., to, to sort things out. Here, we don't have that luxury. There aren't enough virtual machines to, to give you yet another one. Well, I could bring up another one, but 
too many different mach virtual machines is also a complexity issue. So you will actually send the zone from the master name server on the master NSD to OpenDNSSEC running on the master machine and then from OpenDNSSEC running on the master machine to NSD running on the slave. When you have both OpenDNSSEC and NSD on the same machine, both implementing the DNS protocol, you have to be careful so that they don't step on each other's toes. For that reason, we're switching OpenDNSSEC not to use port 53, but rather to use port 5353. 5353. And if you look at the instructions here, they say this is on the master. Notify IP address of the master at sign 5353. So this is the notation in NSD for saying send the notify to a different port. And the same thing goes for the slave. The slave will get the zone from OpenDNSSEC. And here it says request XFR, as in inbound zone transfer, from IP address of the master at port 5353. So it will get the zone from a different port than 53. If it asked for the zone on port 53, it would get it from the unsigned NSD version of the zone. If it gets it from this port, it will get it from OpenDNSSEC where it's signed. So you have to be careful about that and really follow these instructions in detail. Yes, sir? What about the allow notify? Shouldn't it be allowing it from port 5353? This that that would be fine. Uh, it, it will it will receive uh, notifications. From yes. The master. Yes. Uh, okay. Th this basically says we will listen to all notifies. Okay. And the, the the general idea with notify is that you you can you can restrict notify in various ways, saying I will only listen to notifies coming from that IP address, and I will only listen to them if they are teasing signed, and I will only etc. Make it really restrictive, or you can say, what's the security model of notify? Well, if I get a notify from left field here claiming that there is a new version of of a particular zone and that's a lie, that will cause me to issue an SOA query and I will see it was a lie. So there is no real security issue to, to solve here. Yeah, that, that it, it will receive the notification even if it comes from another port. Yes. Okay. So this is just a wider configuration. And, but nothing wrong with yours, but we don't need to make it that narrow. It is often also that open in a sec is run within a secured environment itself where you're not too worried about um, receiving too many notifies because then your network is hacked already. Um. That, that reminds me, m many, many years inside a secure environment, m many years ago I was invited to, to make a presentation in, in Romania. And there were people from the R Romanian security something there making a presentation. But they, they had a design for how to sign email. And the design was that you send your unsigned email over to the security agency and they will sign it for you. And then it will come back and they, you can send it to whoever you're, you intend to send it. And so I was there speaking on, on a different topic, DNSSEC incidentally. And they asked for questions and I, I couldn't help raising my hand and said, I see certain flaws with this security model. <laughs> and the Romanian security guy said, Rrr. and then a professor of the university came up and said, so M Mr. Irene, Mr. Irene, what you don't understand is that the Romanian security agency runs a very secure network. <laughs> so there is no problem to be solved. <laughs> so anyways, follow this in detail and then this is really not a lab exercise that takes hours and hours. I cannot promise that you're done by 6 o'clock, but it's really up to you because it shouldn't take more than, let's say, 45 minutes to, to do this. And it is very, very, very useful. OK? Questions so far? No questions.
One question. No question. And we're available for a few more days, uh, so big enough. <laughs>